In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, oh, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I come to die, oh, and when I come to die, and when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, you can have all this world, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church on this beautiful second Sunday of July. It's great that we can be together. Welcome. We've got some guests with us. Uh, some folks from Minnesota have dropped in for the day. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, Stacy's uh, Stacy's uh, friend. <laughs> God, her guy, as she calls him, uh, Alex, is visiting from Pickering, and it's a good uh, chance to worship with, with Alex, have him join us today and, and be able to fellowship together. It's great that we can gather, and we can be blessed by what God has done as we gather as the body of Christ on this day. Our uh, call to worship comes from Psalm, chap Psalm 8, and it's uh, familiar words, <laughs> wonderful words that tell us about our majestic God. Let's begin together, and we'll do it responsibly as we go on. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I 
consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You, you have made them a little You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds. All the animals of the wild. All the birds in the sky. All the fish in the sea. All the fish in the sea. Father, we're grateful to you that you are majestic, you are wonderful. This creation that we enjoy so much, particularly on this day, particularly when it's so beautiful, we look around, we see the lake just, just moments away, we see the greenery, we see the, the beauty of nature, we feel the warmth of the sunshine, and we are reminded of your care and love for us, Father. At the same time as we are reminded about how majestic you are, how wonderful you are as our God. We also know, Father, that there are times when we feel distant from you, when things assail us, when we feel the pressures of this life. This morning, when we, as we gather, Father, allow us to be able to put aside the things that are struggles and the difficulties so that we may focus on you, that we may see your presence, that we may feel your presence, that we see you with us, that we may know you, you are guiding us and leading us as your people. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for each one that is a part of this gathering this morning. As we worship to you, as we worship you, may we bring you all of the praise, the glory, and the honor that you deserve as our majestic God. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. I will enter his gates. We do it with celebration. <coughs> Sherry, Ben, Venus. Please stand with us.
Lord, like a shepherd, you never stop searching for your sheep. You never stop caring. You never stop forgiving. We confess we need your forgiveness. We confess our sins. You are the shepherd and we are your flock. But we admit the times we have tried to take your place and take control ourselves. We admit that we have not always trusted your good news to be good for us. At times we have pleaded with you to care for us, but we have refused to accept what you willingly gave. We admit that we have held ourselves back from caring for others, and we have ignored the needs of others, our own selfishness has caused us from experiencing your grace and showing it fully to others. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us in the name of Jesus. Loving Shepherd, teach us by the Holy Spirit to follow you in the days and the places of the week ahead. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear God's word. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. Sherry, and lead us as we respond. Please stand with us.
Wayne Gretzky is, has, is, has been or was the greatest hockey player to ever lace on skates. Um, the kinds of records that he has broken have been phenomenal. Uh, at the end of his career, he had tallied over 100 points in 16 seasons of professional hockey. And 14 of, 13 of, 14 of those were consecutive. 14 consecutive seasons with over 100 points. Incredible, the kind of guy he was. He held 61 NHL records, 40 regular season records, 15 playoff records, and six all-star records. He is one amazing hockey player. And still, there, there may be not anybody at this point who rivals the kind of, of a man he was. One would assume that he could easily have shared his vast knowledge with a new generation of players. But after his retirement in 1999, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He did get in a little bit into management, he managed the uh, 2010 um, Canadian hockey men's hockey team, and that went to uh, the gold medal match in, in 2010 in the Olympics. Uh, he did uh, buy into a couple of teams, uh, including the Edmonton Oilers and I think it was the Coyotes, the Phoenix Coyotes or the one of those one yeah, teams down there. Yeah. It was the Phoenix Coyotes, but he never coached. That brings me to an adage that I think really goes well with our passage today is that their great hockey players, or great players, will not always make great coaches. But great coaches will always make great hockey players. Because the greatness of being able to help other people achieve what they want is important, and what they need is important. Gretzky uh, points to two people in his life that were instrumental. One is his dad. His dad had him up from the, he was on skates at the age of three. And he was in his backyard playing on ice at the age of three. By the most, most hockey players that make it to the NHL aren't on skates, well they're on skates early, but they're not playing until about age seven or eight. He was already five years ahead of his nearest rival because of that. And he credits his dad and his dad's abilities to coach him with his success. The second person is, uh, was his coach from the uh, uh, Edmonton Oilers, Glenn Sather. And uh, Glenn Sather was the one that took him uh, and led him and guided him to the point where during Wayne Gretzky's tenure with the Edmonton Oilers, they won the Stanley Cup five out of seven years. And I don't think that's been rivaled in, in recent history either. Two men that had an impact on the greatest hockey player of all time at this point. That shows you what our influence and how we can help other people and the importance of it. Now you think, what does that have to do with discipleship? Part of the discipleship is helping other people grow and develop. And every one of us has the opportunity to help at least one other person. Most of us will have the opportunity to help many other people as they grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul was that mentor, that coach to Timothy. And he was the one who said, listen, Timothy, I'm laying out myself before you. Paul was far more than just uh, an older pastor taking an younger pastor under his wings. Paul was one who, has, uh, who led Timothy to Jesus. He was the one that introduced him to Christ and allowed him to be able to grow under his tutelage. It was under him that Timothy felt that God was calling him into ministry. And Paul listened, or Timothy listened and followed along behind Paul as he learned and as he was taught. He was influenced significantly by Paul. Now think about it for a moment. Who in your life looks to you? Who in your life can you have the opportunity to be able to coach or mentor those people around you that may not be as far along in their spiritual journey, but they're the ones that are going, I don't know, I don't know what to do next. I'm not sure how to live. I'm not sure how to go about being a believer in this world that we live in. How many can you pick out somebody around you? Now, you may say, well, I don't know of anybody. And I'm like, 
then find someone. Look for someone whom you can say, I want to disciple this person. I want to spend time with them. I want to help them to know Jesus better. How to live their life better. How to be more astute. More, more um, how to grow closer to Jesus in their lives. Because that's what we're finding here. An interesting passage that comes out in this aspect of teaching. Because the question we have to ask ourselves is what's important in our lives as we teach and mentor other people? I'm going to skip from verse 1 to the end of verse 2 here in chapter 6. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. Paul tells Timothy, these are things that are important. Now you ask yourself, what is he talking about? What's important? Well, this particular little, little phrase, and it's only the last part of chapter 2, it, it has a backwards view, and it has a forwards view. It goes backwards over the whole of the, whole of the, the book of 1 Timothy. It goes right back to the beginning. It was that first letter that Paul had written to Timothy. And, uh, since, and there's another aspect that takes place here. Timothy was Greek. He had a Jewish mother, and Paul was Jewish. So Paul was not only instructing Timothy on how to be a, a leader, a pastor, but how to be a pastor in a very multicultural situation and setting in which he lived. So this looks back a little bit. Paul begins his letter by urging Timothy to be on guard for false teachers. He recognized that in that culture, as much as it is in our culture today, there are a lot of teaching going along, going around that are consist that people might say is biblical. And the reality is, is that some might not be. Some might be far from the truth that we see in the Bible. So Paul instructs him in how to be able to detect false teachers, how to be on guard for false doctrine. He also instructs Timothy on worship in chapter 2. He then moves on to developing mature leaders in chapter 3. He spends time in chapter 4 talking about relationships, about warning, uh, again, warning more on teachers, but how to have relationships between parents and children, slaves and elders, and all of those different aspects. So he's looking back and he says, this is what I taught you. And then he gets to this particular thing. He says, instruct wisely. Teach proper things. But it connects also to the future. Because these next few verses talk very significantly about what it means to be living in a culture where there's a lot of different opinions, a lot of different views of what God wants to do in a person's life. Or how God wants to act in our culture. And Paul says to Timothy, instruct wisely. Do it properly, he says here. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. So Paul is addressing specifically in these next couple of verses the aspect, the, the aspect of false teachings and the aspect of the seriousness of false teachings that have entered into the church. Paul can reflect back over to Ephesians chapter 4 where it also talks about false teachers and the importance of being aware and wary of people whose teachings may not be correct. Well, the reality is, is that's not much different than today. It's happening now. In verses 3 and following, he begins this, he begins it. He says, if anyone, if anyone teaches others otherwise and does not agree, please do not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. You see, the reality is, it could be any one of us. When Paul uses that little word, anyone, he literally is meaning it could be any person is capable of being, of teaching the wrong thing. And Paul's drawing this idea between those who teach the wrong thing and those who teach the right thing. Now he had spent six, five previous chapters teaching the right things. And now he says, here's, the, here's what you look for to people who are teaching the wrong thing. Here are the things that we've got to watch out for as believers as we seek to mentor and disciple other people that we need to watch out for in our lives and we need to watch out for in other people's lives around us. Because it's very easy for anyone to get caught up in teaching things that aren't correct or aren't right. So there's three different ways that we can tell if we're off base. The first thing is that Paul tells Timothy is basically... Look at what I've taught you. Listen to the words that I've taught you. Now, as Christians today, 
That puts a lot of responsibility on us, doesn't it? We need to know what God says. We need to know what Jesus says. We need to know the basic understandings of what, what is written in here. And most of you are going to say, but I haven't gone to seminary or Bible college. I don't know much of what's in there. How much time do we spend reading it? One of the problems that we have in our 20th century, 21st century church is biblical illiteracy. People don't even open their Bibles. Now I'm not talking just about the book. I'm also talking about anything electronic. We have the opportunity, I've mentioned this before, we have the best, we have one of the most absolute phenomenal opportunities of, some of, the, of reading God's Word in a variety of different things absolutely free. We don't have to worry about going to a bookstore and buying another Bible if we don't have one. We can open up a telephone, or our phones, or a tablet, or our computers at home, and we can read God's Word clearly. It's there. We also have access to some of the best teaching materials, whether it's written, whether it's video, whether it's audio, than every, any time in history. I mean, it's a little bit daunting for me, because maybe before you've come to listen to me, you've listened to Charles Stanley, or Chuck Swindoll, or some other really great TV preacher. And I'm not Chuck Swindoll or Charles Stanley. That's the options we have. Every, the, the amount of teaching that we have is so phenomenal. So we need to recognize that we've got the opportunity to learn ourselves. And that's where it begins. We can't influence other people unless we are learners. Unless we are learning what God has to say in his word so that we can share that and teach others. That's how we learn what is appropriate. We hear it and we go, that doesn't sound quite right. Then we go and we pick up our Bibles and we look it up, we look and find it and we go, nope, that's not right. That's not what Paul said. That's not what the Apostle John said. That's not what Matthew said. Or that's not what Peter said. Or that's not what... And we begin to understand. Anyone can disseminate false teaching. But it's our responsibility to make sure we know what is right. So the second thing that we need to remind, we are reminded of here, or the way we can tell if we're off base, is that it does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, that's, that's huge. If Jesus doesn't say it, if Jesus doesn't command it, then we have to question it. So somebody can't turn and say to you, well, didn't Jesus say... Read Jesus. Read Jesus. If the only thing we ever read in our Bibles is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we will have enough information just in those four books to be able to refute whatever comes along. Because Jesus tells us a lot of things. Jesus tells us how to live. Jesus tells us how to share. Right, Stacy? We talk, I mean, how much have we learned at, uh, in Matthew as we've been studying so and right. Bible study? I mean, we've been learning so much about, about, about what God wants and what Jesus wants in, in a community and in, in a kingdom as we've been studying Matthew. It's just been wonderful as we've been doing it. But we can read that. So the teachings that do not agree with sound instruction of our Lord. And the idea of sound, and this is really interesting that pops up again through this passage, is the idea of sound is the idea of health. And so, unsound is unhealthy. Sound doctrine is healthy doctrine. So unhealthy doctrine leads to divisions. So we're going to see that in just a moment. Healthy doctrine leads to unification and unity. Unsound and unhealthy doctrine leads to, leads to struggles and, and power struggles. Healthy doctrine leads to life. We need to keep those things in our mind. The third way we can tell it, tell it is that it disagrees with the body of godly teaching. It is that aspect that godly and character matter. If somebody is living one way and speaking another way, something's out of whack. If the words that they say and the actions that they do don't mesh and agree with one another, that godly teaching isn't making it to the right spot. In other words, if you want to see other people, you want other people to see Jesus in you, don't only speak it, behave it. 
Live it. Act it. Make sure that what you speak and what comes out of your hands and your feet are the same thing. People should never be looking and going, you say something different than you act. Because that's why. When somebody does something different than they say, what are they doing? What are they? A hypocrite. (laughs) Don't be hypocrites. Godly teaching. So what happens when we go off base? And Paul is not... Not um, he doesn't stop with his words. He 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 hits them pretty hard here. He says, ignorance and arrogance sets in. He goes, they are conceited and understand nothing. Uh, one of the commentators that I, that I read was saying they are they are um, what is, they are pompous ignoramuses. I mean that's that's the idea. They are pompous and they're ignorant. They really think they know a lot. They use a lot of big words and flowery speech, but they really know nothing. Their arrogance and their ignorance is showing. There's also an unhealthy focus on being right. An unhealthy focus on being right. I've got to be right. I've got to point out the latest lace and last little jot and tittle. Well, that's not what this said. And this word and this means, and, and that over here means, and we've got to watch out for it. If we insist on being right, we have to watch out for it. The false teacher has a morbid craving for controversies, and quarrels about word. Well, controversies isn't necessarily a bad word. What Paul uses here talks about how we do need to be careful. And we do need to be challenging people when they are teaching wrong. But the idea of words is the idea that they're digging in to try to find something that separates that may not even be there. So there's five ways that this kills healthy community. There's five ways that this kind of a person who's gone off track harms the body of Christ, harms discipleship. And they're pretty clear because Paul lists them out right there. Envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction. If you walk into a body, you walk into a local church, and those are the things that characterize that church, most likely that church is off base. Most likely the leadership is off base. If somebody comes up and says to you, as soon as they see you, they say, well, what do you think about? Just be careful. Because they may not be what they need to do. Look at those words. Well, envy. We all know what envy is. Oh, I'm better than you. I can be better than you. I know that deep. I've read this book, that book, this book, that book, and I know everything. I've been to, been to seminary for 17 years. See, the reality is, I, I was in a six-year plan. My three-year degree took six years to finish. So I have nothing to say. Um, I, was there for, I was there for three, for six years altogether. But you never, somebody who wants to envy always says, well, I'm better than you. I know more than you. I'm smarter than you. He talks about strife. And that's that contentious disruption of the relationship. And it often arrives from envy. The malicious talk. The interesting point is that the Greek word here is actually the same word that talks about blaspheming God. But in terms of blaspheming people, it's talking about maliciousness. And it's not just, I don't like this, it's like, that's wrong. You're wrong. And it starts to take the person down. Evil suspicions. And I look, I say it this way, it's like seeing the devil around every corner. Seeing the devil in every conversation. Seeing the devil in everything. Oh, yeah, now I know where you come from. Oh, I've got you painted now. I know you. That's the kind of thing that comes out. And the last one is that constant friction between people of a corrupt mind. Something that people thrive on. It's a twisted understanding of truth. It's my truth instead of the Spirit's truth, instead of God's truth. It's, it's the idea of focusing. And here's where Paul brings in another whole aspect he brings this aspect of money and finances. They see a way of getting rich off of things that are taught wrong. Keep that in your mind for a moment. People like that like to control budgets. They like to control giving. People like that are trying to focus on money, trying to stop churches from spending money, trying to start or make churches spend money in places they shouldn't spend money. The reality is, It's unhealthy. All of it is unhealthy. So the next question we have to ask ourselves is, 
How do we be a good spiritual coach, a good discipler? Verse 6 talks very clearly. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. So he's talked about those who have been dissension, those who are pulling people apart, those who are full of, of dissent, dis, the dissension, those who are strong, those who want to make sure that they're always right. The focus on contentment is a different focus altogether. Focus on not being right. Somebody who is content doesn't have to be right all the time. They can say, oh well, that's your opinion, but not mine. Have a nice day. They don't have to sit there and dog you on it. And you're wrong. It's, it's okay. It's all right. We can focus on not being right. Paul uses the term gain, and it's the same word he uses in the verse prior that talks about aspects of finance and wanting more money. And Paul takes that and he transitions it. He changes it. And he says, great gain is contentment, not chasing after the dollar. Great gain is being, being happy with what you have, not always looking for something more. What do we need to be truly content? Paul asks us that question. What do we need to be truly content? Well, we didn't bring anything into the world. We're not taking anything out of the world. That limits a lot. That takes a lot out of it, doesn't it? Paul actually said very clearly. Did you have breakfast this morning? Do you have clothes on? Contentment. Recognizing that oftentimes the things that make us want more isn't healthy. Isn't being the right thing. Paul's understanding, you know, we brought nothing in. We don't need anything. Paul's understanding of contentment came out of his own experience. Listen to what he wrote here in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. He says this, I'm not saying this because I am in need, or I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every and any situation, whether well-thought or hungry, whether living or plenty, or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In the midst of the struggles, contentment is I can do everything through Christ. He's the one that gives me strength to do the things that I need to do. And the writer of Hebrews, chapter 13, says something very similar. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Doing everything through Christ, knowing that God is always there. That's contentment. That's what Paul is focusing on. If we want to demonstrate what it means to be discipling other people, we need to be content with what God has given us. Recognizing that God will never leave us nor forsake us, and that we can do everything through Christ who gives us strength. We need to be content. The second thing we need to do as we, do as we seek to disciple others is keep temptations in check. Keep temptations in check. We got to watch out for that. He says very clearly here, um, he says, you, those who want to get rich fall into, the, fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Remember me this, that Jesus was tempted in every which way that we are, yet was without sin. He faced those struggles. He understood what it was like to deal with people around him who were nitpicky. He knew what it was like when people walked away from him. He knew what it was like when even his closest of friends turned their back on him as he hung on that cross. He understands all of the things that we face as human beings in this world, yet he chose not to sin. He chose not to sin. While Paul uses financial terms here, Paul talks about greed, but he also talks, I think we can also substitute some other things in there, and they're all related. Things like power, authority, those are things that people clamor for, 
They may not want money, but they want to know that they're the one in control. They're the one that you have to come and ask for. You're, they're the one. But watch out for those as well. Keep temptations in check. And the last thing that we can do is avoid the trap of foolish and harmful desires. Greed is part of that. In the aspect of money, greed is there. Wanting to get rich. Verse 9, point in that. Verse 9 and 10 point not that wealth is wrong. It doesn't say that money is wrong. It doesn't say that having money is wrong. It says that the love of money is the root of many kinds of evil. And it's not that the love of money is the root of evil. It's the root of many kinds of evil. It's the idea that when you put greed first, when money becomes the thing that's important, when power becomes the thing that's important, when being right becomes the thing that's important, when striving more for your own gain becomes the thing that's important, everything else gets screwed up. Everything else gets thrown out the window. Because we've forgotten the most important aspect, which was focusing on contentment. Focusing on contentment. There are three phrases here that make this clear. He says, people want to get rich. There's a love of money at the root of all kinds of evil. And people are eager for money. Eager. It's talking about the intensity that's behind this. If we focused on being content with the same intensity that some people focus on riches, some people focus on power. Some people focus on authority. If we focus that same intensity on being content, what difference might our lives look like? How different might we influence those around us? How might we make a difference as we teach and encourage those who are farther behind us in their spiritual journey? If we spend time Focusing on contentment. You see, the discipleship journey, it is. It's loving. I talked about that a few weeks ago. It's following the example. But it is also mentoring and teaching. We do that with contentment. God, you got this. And I trust you. Let's pray again. Father, thank you so much for our time. Thank you so much for studying your word here that Paul wrote so many years ago. Thank you that you long to teach us something today. Father, I pray that as we have that you your word today, that you have spoken your word to us. Despite my word or my words, speak to us. Thank you, Father, for it. Father, may we seek, may we seek contentment May we follow the example of Paul, Jesus, and Timothy as we long to be people that influence and mentor others and coach others for you. Thank you, Jesus, for guiding us and leading us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a choice we make to follow Jesus. The man comes with, uh, now. Let's keep that in mind, that we make a choice, a choice to say, I have decided to follow again. And all of that means. Sure, man.
morning. I just want to read a card to you from the Gavin family. It says, First Baptist Church, so there's a special thanks. So here's a special thanks to warmly let you know your thoughtfulness means so much, more than any words could show. Thank you. The card sent to Mom, Lois, for all the special occasions were always a warm welcome and appreciated by her. They always cheered her up. Thank you for doing that. She also looked forward to her visits with Pastor Rod and Deacon Candale. Thank you also for the plant she dropped off at the house. Janice and family. The chance there we've had to uh, influence a family and a generation for Jesus. As we come to prayer this morning, what things can we pray about? Family prayer, what can we pray about? What things can we praise God for today? Stacy. Vance? Yeah, I'm afraid to move. I just pray that it's okay. I'll have to ask somebody about it. I know somebody that can give me some, maybe I'll give you some information on that. I'll have to ask them. Okay, we'll pray for that. Definitely. And as we all, we need to continue to remain, remember the homeless and those that are on the margins because there are an awful lot, and that's getting larger. As the cost of living goes up, as the cost of everything is rising, People who are, let, who are right on that threshold of being able to afford to live in a home may not be able to. There may be more people living on the streets come the fall, so let's keep that in mind as we do that, as we pray. Other things we can pray for this morning? Let's keep our, our brothers and sisters up at Salvation Army in prayer. Their new uh, lieutenants start today, so it's their first Sunday uh, at, the, uh, at Suncoast Citadel, so we'll pray for the Ludlow family. They've, uh, I'm not sure where they're coming from. I don't remember exactly. But uh, we look forward to having to know them a little bit more over the next number of years as they minister here in Godrich. So it's a real privilege to be able to do that. So we'll keep our friends at Salvation Army in, uh, in, our, in our prayers as well. Can we pray for Sean? Yes. A tough week for Sean, so we'll pray for him as he's uh, struggling with a few things. Other things we can pray for, praise God for today. Stacy got more. We got more here than that. Absolutely. That's B, right? Yes. We'll pray for B. He's been through a lot, but continued healing. God has healed. That means God has done work. God has been healing. And we continue to heal. Excellent. We'll definitely pray for you, B. Pray for Bob. Mm-hmm. Bob had a little bit of a, a little bit of a, an infection this kind of this week after his procedure last week. So, but he's feeling better. He was enough. He, he it was enough for him to uh, to play with play us a game of mini putt up at uh, Point Farms Market last night. So, was that? Anyone? Anyone? So, <laughs> I couldn't remember whether he won or not, but he did win. So, uh, it was good. He's feeling well enough for that. So, definitely continue to pray for Bob. Other things we can pray for. I'd just like to praise God for mm. the summer, the beautiful weather, mm. uh, bringing all these people to Godridge, and things are opening up, and there's lots of music and lots of going on that we used to have, and it's just great. Being down at the lake. Oh, so yeah. I was down at the, down at the uh, piping down the sun on Friday night. The piping down the sun. And uh, I love, I always enjoy it listening to the pipes because they, the last one they played was uh, Amazing Grace. They start off with a soul piper, and then as they bring the elements in, it just, every time I hear it, it always makes my, makes the hand, hair on my arms stand up. Amen. And I have tears coming down my, my cheeks, just the beauty of listening to the pipers pipe. Uh, playing Amazing Grace. Oh, it, just, it was beautiful. So we're grateful for that. Thanks, Jan. Let's come before God, shall we? Father, we're grateful to you because you are a good God. We live in a beautiful location. And we, we thank you for that. We thank you for a lake just down the street. We thank you for beautiful rolling hills. We thank you for wonderful people in our community. We thank you for a community that is that we're a part of. Thank you for this place that you have placed us. Thank you for being able to go mini golfing or go to see a play or go down and watch Pipers. These are all wonderful, good things you've given to us. And Father, you long to give us good things. We should never sit there and go, oh, I don't like it. 
because you've given us blessings and blessings, family, friends, homes, health, and we thank you for all of those. We are grateful to you, Father, grateful for the things that you give to us, things that come right from your hand. Father, as we, as we, as we think and we pray today, there are some few people that are on our minds. Father, we do pray for Lance and we pray for the others that are homeless. And we pray, Father, for those that are just on that cusp of perhaps being homeless, relying on food banks, relying on the help of others, but not quite there yet. Father, we pray that you would help, that we would be a community and a neighborhood and people that see those around us that are struggling and help them. May we do so as a church. May we support those ministries in town that help those. Father, we pray for Lance. We do pray that we hope that he's got himself a new place, a place that he can call home. And there are many others who are also struggling in that same way. And we pray, Father, that we would help those folks to find those spots that are needed. Father, we also want to pray for our friends at the Salvation Army, many, a key ministry here in town, Father, to help many who are on the, on the margins. We pray for them as they welcome their new pastoral couple. We pray that you would be with them as they build together new relationships and friendships over these next months, weeks, and years. Father, we thank you for the, the times that, were, that uh, the Kerr family was here and we wish them and bless them, Father, as they had all, as they're now in Saskatoon. And we ask, Father, that you would continue to build the relationships between our churches here in this community. For it's as the body of Christ working together we are able to touch the lives of many. Father, we also want to pray for Sean as he has had a tough week and a couple of difficult, difficult things came his way. We pray that you be with him, give him your grace and your, your strength, Father. May he always be reminded that uh, you know what he's going through and you are with him. Those are the powerful aspects of our discipleships, knowing and remembering that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, we also want to um, pray for uh, Bob, and we thank you, Father, for, uh, um, for helping him as he dealt with some infection this week. Thank you for caring for him. How thank you for uh, giving him the strength that he needs each day to keep going as he faces this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, some of the issues that he, that he does with his health. We pray for me, too, Father. We ask that you would be with her, Father. You have worked in her. You have encouraged her. You have strengthened her. You have healed her and you're restoring her. And we pray that you continue to do that for her. May she know your presence in a very special way. May she know that you are working in her and, re and restoring her. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Father, thank you. Thank you for visitors. Thank you for guests that are with us. And thank you, Father, for bringing people in as we worship today. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace that has been poured out to us. And now, Father, as we go into this week, we can ask your blessing. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, announcements for this coming week. Uh, we did a little bit of work downstairs. We're thinking that we're going to be able to get some drywall up on walls in that basement, the bathroom downstairs in the next week. And that's going to be really exciting. We're getting ready and putting some insulation on the walls. So the washroom is coming along. And we're grateful that we have those who are helping to do that. Uh, Bible study will be this coming Wednesday at 1.30. And then prayer meeting will be at 2.30 on Thursday. So we're looking forward to those as well. Uh, in two weeks, two weeks from today, I won't be here. I'll be away on holidays and Pastor Stephen Hamming will be coming in to, to speak to us and looking forward to that as well. So that's coming up. Any other announcements that you know of offhand or anything? Nothing that you know. Okay. Cherry Band, would you lead us in our last song? This is a, a one that's fairly new, but there's some oldness in it. So uh, I know David takes the lead along on this. Feel free to sing along as you see, as you desire. Band leaders.